marine biogeography class that we created three years ago to uh, serve a couple different ends. The first is uh, we have a, a, ver a fairly involved training in scientific diving here on campus. And one of the things that we found is that giving them something to do with that skill after their initial training is going to lock in those skills. And we also talk a lot about student success on campus, and I'm really personally fixated in helping them succeed out there in the research world, which is ugly and difficult. So what this class does is it gives our science divers a chance to participate directly in the statewide monitoring program of kelp forests, literally encompassing multiple places over the entirety of the state, and to see all of the imperfections and the challenges associated with really doing a marine pro a, a project in the marine environment in multiple different locations. Um, what we won't be hearing about today is most of the stuff that happened on our trips. We won't be hearing anything about driving activities on my part. <laughs> Nothing that ha was discussed around the campfires will be discussed in this presentation, nor will any South Korean delicacies be discussed at any juncture. But with that, I'll turn you over to my very capable group. Good luck. Thank you. So, I had to get one out of the way. Alright, um, so California has a very extensive coastline uh, spanning 10 degrees of latitude. Um, it sees huge variations within the subtitle of ecosystems um, throughout it. Um, Point Conception, right there, um, splits California into two provinces um, in, in which we um, uh, identified four distinct zones uh, for the scope of this class. <clears throat> so this is the third year, uh, like James said, uh, continuing this long-term monitoring program. Uh, long-term monitoring programs like these are very important. Um, uh, unfortunately, a lot of important ecological processes take a very long time um, to really uh, gain an understanding of. Long-term monitoring projects like this can help us produce uh, hopefully effective ecological models to um, predict the future and help us be uh, proactive rather than reactive in our conservation efforts. Um, the first site, or the, the northernmost site that we, um, that we surveyed um, was our coldest and um, most um, overtaken by urchins, uh, as you can see here. Um, currently they're experiencing a, a kelp die-off uh, phenomenon that is um, largely due to uh, the overabundance of red and purple urchins. Um, <coughs> next was uh, Maccabee Beach. Uh, it is our most local site, um, right off Cannery Row. It's a pretty patchy reef, um, and uh, it, it's uh, characterized by uh, rock, sand, kelp, and uh, on the particular day that we dove it, um, a brown sea nettle storm, which proved to be pretty interesting. Um, the uh, second uh, site near us, Hopkins uh, State Marine Reserve, just a mile down, um, pretty similar uh, conditions, um, but since it is a marine life refuge and has been since 1931, um, it's had uh, the wonderful ability um, to uh, have an overwhelming abundance of life there. We've got a really good opportunity um, to see just what uh, these um, MPAs are capable of. Um, Refugio was our first site past Point Conception into the San Diego province. <clears throat> it, uh, it was um, interesting. Uh, we, it was characterized by wide range of visibility and, um, and levels of surge of this really interesting shale reef. and was our first glimpse into just how much um, Point Conception acts as a transition zone into um, species diversity. La Jolla Cove uh, was our southernmost site and nice and warm, beautiful Southern California, um, and probably, uh, I would say, the most exciting for all of us to dive. Um, it was by far the most different than um, anything that we're used to locally, and uh, got a really phenomenal opportunity um, to see uh, <coughs> just how diverse the California subtitle ecosystem is. So for our methods, we use the RCCA um, protocol, which is the ReCheck California uh, protocol. And um, this protocol is used by many universities and um, institutions and focuses on rocky reef and 
kelp forests. Um, this protocol requires scientific divers, and all of our divers are scientifically certified. And um, so in our transects, you can see um, six core transects, which was surveyed um, all of our, like all the different categories, the algae and birds and fish, and you can see we're all surveyed in these six core transects. And then the other 12 transects were fish only transects. And then, so there was 18 altogether, but the main focus of the RCCA was fish. Um, it's also important to note that the um, RCCA works from a fixed species list. So the survey that we did were off of just the list that they want us to survey. So I will dive in a little bit deeper to those um, different categories and how we survey for those. Um, so the first one is Uniform Point Contact, or UPC. Um, it's basically just looking at the substrate itself. Um, we can think of it as a layer cake. So this is the bottom layer of that cake. Um, and it helps give a lot of background information as to what else we will see on our dives. Um, so we survey the substrate, which is classified on um, size differences from sand to reef and anthropogenic. Um, as we can see in this bottom photo, there's like some pipes off Maccabee Beach. Um, the next one has relief or rigosity, which is the height difference of the seafloor, a half meter on either side of the transect. Um, so some areas, if you get sand, it's usually pretty flat. Um, so it would be a zero, and if it's higher rigosity, you might have a little bit more light. Um, and the last thing is the type of cover on that substrate. Um, so at every one meter mark on the 30 meter transect, we look and see what is there. Um, and that can range from Crestos coralline, aggregated coralline, um, to brown, green, red algae. Um, so that's UPC. The next one is algae. Um, so kind of similar to UPC, it doesn't move, it's just waiting for us to find it. Um, so we are looking for eight different species of algae, three of which are invasive, just noting the presence if it's there. Um, when we survey giant kelp, it has to be greater than a meter high, and we count all the stipes of that kelp to kind of see how dense that kelp is. Um, and for all other algae types, it has to be greater than 30 centimeters to be counted on the transect. Mm -hmm. For invertebrates, this is where it gets a little more exciting because they can move, some of them can move. Um, so we're thir um, surveying 31 different types of invertebrates, um, everything from abalone to gregonian. Um, and we, if, so in Crystal Cove, there were a lot of purple urchins, so we survey up to the 50th individual um, and after that point, we just note the present or the point at which we found the 50th because we don't want to count 300 urchins on a transect. Um, we measure all of the abalone that we find to kind of monitor how they're growing. And we bring flashlights on these dives so we can better identify the species that we're seeing. And we look in cracks and crevices to try and see like if we miss anything on the transect. Um, so the most exciting of all of these is fish, um, which is what our main focus is for all of this. Um, so, we are looking for um, 35 different species of fish. Um, with the fish transects, it's kind of different because the first three that we were looking at um, were kind of focused downwards, looking on the bottom, but fish can swim. Um, so it's a two meter by two meter swath, which means two meters on the transect and two meters up, we're looking in that whole area. Um, so we're swimming forward trying to find all of these fish. And when we do see a fish, if it's in that swath, we record the size of the fish and the species of the fish. Um, and there are certain species that are visibly different with male and female, so we do record if it was a male or a female for those species. Um, and fish that are smaller than 10 centimeters are categorized as young of the year. Um, so there's, you'll see later in our data how many young of the year we found, um, but they just get grouped into that category. Now for our project effort, this is everything we did during our trips to make this project possible. Uh, we had to drive to each location in vans provided by the school, sometimes spending many hours in them. Uh, we had to set up camp at campsites near our survey sites. And then we took over the beaches and covered it with all our scuba diving gear. We had to haul gear up and down hills, which can get very heavy. And uh, you can see we, um, on the logistics effort category, we have the dives completed, how many transects we laid down, 
our depth range, the total area surveyed, how long we spent in the vans, and how long we were in the water at each of the sites. Uh, but we can just look at the totals over here. It's all our hard work put together. So we go 149 dives all together, laid down 222 transects. Our diving range was 6 to 44 feet. Our total area survey was 6,900 square meters, which is about 1,500 square meters larger than the football field. Spent 48 hours in the vans, <laughs> two days sitting there in the vans, <laughs> and then 111 hours under water, which is about four and a half days. So then, now for what we found, uh, we're going to see a couple of slides that look like this, that just have charts that represent data from of the six sites and uh, we're starting off with UPC substrate so as uh, Nick talked about before the substrate is kind of the bottom layer of the cake of uh, my cake is a subtitle habitat <laughs> and uh, so sort of what is everything else living on top of so it's important to know that so substrate uh, most of the sites was either reef or sand uh, which wasn't that unexpected. We're not supposed to have too many points of sand according to reef check protocols. We're not supposed to have more than 10 meters of continuous sand along the transect because we don't want to be uh, sampling sand because it's usually just bare. There's nothing on top of it. We want to be sampling reefs. So now uh, for the cover type, the next layer of the cake, what's living on top of the substrate we have uh, the cover varied greatly throughout all the sites. It's mainly uh, what's not moving on top of the substrate, like algae or invertebrates, some invertebrates. We had a lot of points that didn't have anything on them, which would be the none, which uh, is either just bare rock or bare sand. And we think that might be because we had so many sand substrate counts on the substrate part. But uh, the highest amount of cover of a living thing was red algae through, overall throughout all the sites. All right, so now we get to, now we get to all the moving species. So here we have the abundance of invertebrates at all the sites. Purple urchins dominated until basically the California spiny lobster uh, came around. And it's interesting because the California spiny lobster is a predator of the purple urchins. Um, the bat stars were also very prevalent in the northern sites, but after the transition, they weren't present. Um, as mentioned before, we only, we only recorded select species, but there was many, many other species observed, which included nudibranchs, jellies, and octopus. So here are the top five fish species at all sites. We grouped them just by top five because with 35 species, you can imagine if there was just one or two and you had 10 of those, this, these charts would be very messy. Um, the uh, senior, there was no senior readers at Gristle Cove, but they occurred at all of the other sites. Uh, the uh, rockfish species were very prevalent in the northern sites and refugio, but did not occur at, site, at La Jolla site one and two. Um, young of the year, uh, the young of the year cohorts uh, were present at Maccabee, Hopkins, and La Jolla site one and two, and also. Other species weren't recorded, but they were observed, which included the horn shark, which you saw earlier, um, lingcod, and buffalo sculpin. So the uh, fish data is significant, like was a significant focus of this survey. So the following slides are going to be some high charts uh, created of the uh, percent assemblage. I mean percent. Uh, uh, compilation of the species assemblage. So in Herzl Cove, which was our most northern site, uh, the dominant species was blue rockfish, and that's. Uh, and so our next site was Maccabee, which is our local dive site. 
Uh, and the prevalent species, dominant species was young of the year. And this is right about where uh, Senorita uh, range is starts. So uh, they start to appear. And right down the street, or street was Hopkins Marine Station. So it's pretty similar in uh, assemblage where Senorita was the dominant species followed by young of the year. Uh, it's pretty interesting with Refugio. That was the transit transition area between the Oregonian province and the uh, San Diego province. So there was a mixture like the uh, the assemblage was more evenly distributed, and rockfish are still present, and their southern species uh, start to occur. Uh, La Jolla site one was mainly dominated by Senorita, Senorita and the southern species are also uh, present. And La Jolla site two is pretty interesting because it was located right on the side of an MPA, so that might uh, explain why the distribution of the fishes are more equal. And then with all sites concluded, uh, there's a very dominant uh, Senorita and Young of the Year for the dinosites, and then the other fish that we had collected. So we would just like to take a moment to acknowledge everyone who helped us make this possible. Um, everyone who was kind of a part of the class that isn't here today. All of our volunteer divers, um, everyone who let us use their ocean to survey, um, and of course the school for letting us use all the equipment. Um, so just a big thank you to everyone who helped make this possible because with the 10 of us in the class, we still didn't have enough hands or fins um, to get all of it done. So we need a lot of help. Um, here's some cool photos to kind of take a peek at from us on our trips while we open the floor to questions. 